Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nian Chiu. Uh, I'm a practicing nephrologist from Texas. So today we're going to talk about uh, acute kidney injury in the COVID. Uh, we call it a uh, COVID-associated uh, acute kidney injury as well. Uh, we all know that uh, COVID is uh, ravaging the world and it's a global pandemic. It's, we already have uh, lost many lives. Uh, a lot of people have a uh, in injury to the kidneys and they need a dialysis, especially if they are admitted to ICU. So yeah, US is the most hit country. We all know that uh, I think we have about uh, 45 million cases and uh, we lost you know, more than 700,000 lives. So followed by India and Brazil. So what is the acute kidney injury? Usually we talk about not chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury. People with COVID, they might have a chronic kidney disease, but they have acute head by COVID related complication. So here is the acute kidney injury definition. <coughs> uh, you know, different centers reported differently depend on the acute kidney injury definition, but I would like to use uh, kidney disease improving global outcomes. We call it KDGO. So like I mentioned before, uh, COVID-19 hospitalized patients, they have close to, you know, 50% uh, have acute kidney injury, uh, you know, uh, component. That proportion is increasingly higher in people, those who need uh, ICU admission, intubation, things like that. It close to 70% uh, in uh, mechanically intubated patients. So this is a KDECO uh, definition for acute kidney injury. Uh, we mentioned the serum creatinine. We all know that serum creatinine is a substance uh, usually produced in the muscles, should be filled up by the uh, kidneys. Usually uh, we measure in the US a milligram or deciliter. Usually it's about 0.6 to 1.2, depend on the muscle mass, age, body build, race, gender, things like that. It might be, uh, you know, uh, vary. Uh, increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 milligram a deciliter or more within 40 hours. That's the acute kidney injury. For example, your baseline uh, creatinine is 0.6 and then the uh, next day 0.9. So even though serum creatinine is less than one, we still call the acute kidney injury. Uh, the purpose is so that we can detect acute kidney injury uh, uh, quickly and we can intervene. So you can look at the acute kidney injury definition. You can see the all. If you meet something, one of those facts, it's uh, they have uh, acute kidney injury. Increase in serum creatinine to 1.5 times baseline or more within last seven days. So for example, you have a serum creatinine about uh, two uh, at baseline, you have a chronic kidney disease stage three slash four, depending on the age. Okay, you're creating one up to three uh, within uh, two, three days. So patients had acute kidney injury. Okay, some people, they have a very low muscle mass. You know, I see the uh, one or two patients go with, they are mechanically ventilated, uh, cacadic, uh, and volume overloaded, especially creatinine is kind of diluted with the volume overload. And then uh, creatinine might not be high, about 0.9 and 1, but the urine output drastically drops and they have a acute kidney injury. So during output less than 0.5 mil per kilo per hour, let's say for example, if you have a 60 kilogram man or woman, uh, they have about less than 30 cc per hour for more than six hours, they have an acute kidney injury. So you have to meet either one of those. So to meet the criteria for acute kidney. So you all see that, right? This is AKI. So we use a, Kidney disease, improving global outcomes, KDGO criteria. <coughs> These are the definition of uh, AKI. Increase in serum creatinine 0.3 or more within two days or increase in creatinine for more than one and a half times baseline within seven days or the patient's urine output drop less than 0.5 mil per kilo per hour for six hours. And we have a different stages too. This is a different state. Uh, 
this is you know good for the differentiation but you know when you really practicing you don't have a time to do that you know the patient has acute kidney injury that's it and they're getting worse but for the you know uh academic purpose uh serum creating we all talk about 1.5 more than 1.5 baseline acute kidney injury so here the stage one is 1.5 to two times close to two times 1.9 times baseline or during output 0.5 mil per kilo per hour for six to 12 hours. So that's a stage one acute kidney injury. We all know that chronic kidney disease stage one, two, three, four, five. This is the KD uh, classification of the acute kidney injury stage one, two, three. Uh, another thing is uh, if you, when do you call the stage two of acute kidney injury? For example, your baseline creatinine is one. Okay, creatinine two, three days later, boom, 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 two and three. So, ah, this is a acute kidney injury stage two. Usually we don't document it, but just we just say acute kidney injury. Oh, this is drastically it's drastically increasing. Oh, during output is drastically dropping. Okay, for example, the 60 kilogram man, 30 cc per hour, oh, more than 24 hours dog, patient is now making urine. The whole night I have about 100 cc, things like that. Oh, definitely these are stage two, three, very severe. And then uh, with the COVID, acute kidney injury is very unpredictable. For, for example, usually volume depletion, uh, acute tubular necrosis, you know, the rise of the creatinine was very gentle, one, 1.5, two, three. But with the COVID, some patient I see creatinine jump up to three from one next day, which is kind of drastic. Usually you see those kind of rise in the creatinine in the, both bilateral, you know, renal artery stenosis or, you know, clamping or bilateral urethral obstruction by bilateral nephrolithiasis, things like that. This is the drastic, drastic changes. And then uh, we call it stage three acute kidney injuries, pretty severe, the severest form of AKI, creating one up to three, three times. And then a urine output is less than 0.3 mil per kilo per hour for more than 24 hours. Basically, anuric, and you remain less than 100 cc within 24 hours. <clears throat> so, uh, depend on your baseline creatinine. Your baseline creatinine is, let's say, two. You have a chronic kidney disease, and your patient's creatinine went up to five, six. So, not, you know, basically three times, but increasing creatinine more than four. It belongs to uh, stage three of acute kidney injury. So this is kind of more like academic purpose, but we don't usually document it. But uh, if you see the drastic rise in the creatinine, you see, oh, this patient has very severe acute kidney injury. Okay, we'll go to next slide. So uh, we all know that people die from the hypoxia, they, you know, oxygen level drops. So that's why they die. Okay, so acute, uh, you know, ARDS is more common. That is the leader cause. But again, pulmonary manifestations are most important. So that's why people require high amount of oxygen. And, uh, but, you know, the most important thing is uh, one of my attendings uh, used to ask me and our fellows when I was doing a fellowship in U University of Texas uh, five, six years ago. Okay, Nayan, what is the most common cause of uh, you know, etiology of the acute tubular necrosis. Uh, we say hypotension, or oh, sepsis, things like that. No, what is that? So hypoxia. Hypoxia, because kidney uh, consume the 25% of the cardiac output from the heart. It consume a lot of oxygen. So whenever you have uh, hypoxia uh, from the uh, fluid, let's say pulmonary edema or ARDS, so, you know, uh, inflammatory reaction in the lungs, pneumonia. If you get a hypoxia before you get a hypotension, the kidney doesn't have a, you have a tubular necrosis and you can have a acute kidney injury. So I think this is most uh, important, you know, uh, you know, thing leading to acute kidney injury. So, but uh, what you can see is uh, some people, COVID patients admitted to the hospital require minimum amount of oxygen. Uh, they don't have uh, acute kidney injury, so they have mortality is lower. If you're hospitalized, require high amount of oxygen, hypoxic, uh, 
having a you know high flow nasal cannula, uh, non invasive uh, respiratory like uh, BiPAPs, and then a mechanical ventilation, the higher chances of hypoxia and the higher chances of trachea is higher, along with uh, mortality as well. So. <clears throat> And uh, like I said before, uh, you know, ICU COVID patients, uh, you know, uh, the up to the 50, 70 uh, percent are require kidney replacement therapy because of that. Okay, next slide is a little picture. You can see compare, comparing lungs and kidneys. On the left-hand side, the lungs, you can see the alveoli. Uh, you can see the cytokines that are produced from the uh, D cells. And then this is a kind of, uh, COVID is kind of uh, what you call it, uh, inflammatory, uh, thromboinflammatory condition, increases the inflammatory state to the highest and also the associated with the endothelial dysfunction and activation of the coagulation cascade. So thromboinflammatory disease, basically, that's why people die. So COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection virus came into the uh, alveoli. So it activated the, uh, uh, you know, inflammatory cell and, you know, immune system. So immune system produce inflammatory cells and macrophage, neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, they came in, they produce cytokines. So it can accelerate cytokine storm. It's, cytokine storm is not as severe as in a septic shock and ARDS not related with COVID, but still you have a cytokine storm. And also the in the lungs, you can have a blood vessels. You can see the thrombosis here uh, because of the endothelial injury and activation of coagulation cascade. So, and then you see the net neutrophils, you know, entrapment uh, uh, traps. So this is kind of the part of the acute inflammation and also the uh, T cell inflammation too. Uh, the same thing happening in the kidneys. Usually kidney, this is chromarulas going to the proximal tubule, distal convoluted tubule. Uh, so it can affect the tubular injury in a different uh, segment of the tubules and also it can affect the glomeruli. So basically here it shows up in the tubule. So tubule, you still have a direct toxicity by viral infection and also the activation of immune system, you can have an inflammatory response and regional inflammation as well. And you can have a thrombosis in the blood vessels. Blood vessels go into the glomerulus and blood vessels in the peritubular area, they have a thrombosis. Uh, then one interesting thing about, uh, you know, uh, COVID, is that they find a lot of microvascular thrombi in the kidneys and other organs. So that can increase the damage. <coughs> Here, usually they say that DEMB dam. I will explain in other picture too. Dam is a damage associated uh, molecular pattern. This is the PAM is a pathogen associated molecular pattern. I'm not familiar with those uh, terms, but when I look at it, it means the uh, severity of the inflammation. Uh, usually it's highest mortality. So in the COVID, you will see the severe, severest form of the, most severe form of the uh, you know, inflammation. Okay, so, so the most you know, lethal cause for the mortality is uh, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. It can cause local inflammation in the lungs. Like I said before, it's a recruitment of immune cells, including the T cell, macrophage, and neutrophils. So like I said, cytokines are produced locally in the lungs associated or response to the uh, damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns. That led to further recruitment of the inflammatory cells and tissue damage. And uh, you can see the secretion of the interferon uh, from immune cells. So interferon is also the cytokines as well. You can see on the left-hand side of the picture. So uh, interferon is good, actually, body. Usually, you know, we used to do the interferon infusion for the hepatitis C patient, things like that. In the COVID, interferon is really good. They tested interferon. But the thing is, interferon can cause uh, glomerular injury by causing the borosite injury. So that's why they're a little shy from using it. And also the neutrophils. Neutrophils is for the acute inflammatory status. So that active inflammatory cells produce a net neutrophil extracellular traps 
that leading to the local inflammatory response too. So basically AID is coming from uh, local regional inflammation from recruitment of the you know, immune cells, including everything, macrophage, T-cells and neutrophils. So kind of like a battlefield uh, between the COVID and immune system. Uh, there you go. This is a nice picture of the chromaulins. This is a messenger cell. This is the efferent. Uh, left hand side is the efferent arterioles. Right hand side is the efferent arterioles. And uh, when this, uh, you know, SARS virus come in uh, through the systemic circulation through the efferent, it can cause directly to the <coughs> proximal tubule injury. And also the, uh, it goes into the blood vessels inside the kidneys and glomerular capillaries. So it can cause endothelial damage. So complements can cause endothelial damage. The SARS virus itself can cause endothelial damage. And uh, the collapsing glomerulopathy. And uh, it is, collapsing glomerulopathy is more commonly found in a less severe COVID patients because it is associated with some APOL1 you know, gene defect. Uh, here we have uh, Afro-American uh, black patients and they have a uh, APOL1 gene deficient. They are prone to have a uh, hypertensive attributable ESRD or hypertension attributable FSGS, focal segment and glomerulosclerosis because of the APOL1 gene defect. Because they have a protocyte injury. They're more prone to have protocyte injury and then they're prone to have a collapsing glomerulopathy from a proteinuria for long term and later on, uh, they lose the kidney function gradually. And that can cause the proteinuria, it's a part of the spectrum. <laughs> and then when the SAR virus come in, you see the acute tubular necrosis, especially in proximal cells. So you can see this, you know, spectrum of diseases. It can affect the uh, glomerulus and a porocyte, and it can cause, these uh, blue things are porocyte, can cause porocyte damage and collapsing glomerulopathy with time, proteinuria, it can cause vessel damage by doing the endothelial damage. It can cause microthrombosis uh, from the endothelial damage and it can activate uh, uh, the whole coagulation cascade, including the platelets. And also all the damage happening, the, they fight each other and then a uh, cytokine you know, storm and then uh, later on, fibrinic necrosis setting. So a lot of damage can happen in the kidneys in different mechanisms. Another thing is uh, increased renal interstitial pressure leading to the uh, tissue edema, likely in induce the uh, tubular injury too. Uh, that's uh, meaning that uh, when you have uh, uh, basically the right heart failure and also the, uh, you have uh, AIDS, so you have a, a backward failure. So there is a venous return is delayed. So increased backward pressure going all the way from the right heart failure from the venous you know, system to the renal. So you have a uh, renal vein engorgement later on, they have increased hydrostatic pressure, the fluid leaks out. And then uh, you, we all know the kidneys are encapsulated organs. So uh, the fluid cannot go anywhere to increase interstitial pressure decrease the blood vessels, suppress the blood vessels, so decrease blood supply. So that can lead to, uh, you know, more tissue pressure inside, you know, more edematous, kidneys are edematous. That can lead to ischemia and, you know, tubular injury too. So that tubular injury perpetuates. And also that we talk about the local inflammation uh, for dams and pumps. So they can release, they can be released to systemic circulation. Uh, they can come from the lungs, goes to the kidney. And then again, uh, kidneys are damaged from the backward pressure from their heart and lungs. And also it can, you know, uh, you know kidneys can be accessible by those kind of, uh, uh, you know, damage associated, uh, you know, factors. So that can damage the kidney again, double whammy. And also uh, they came in and they start to, you know, inside the local inflammatory response. And plus, when the immune system comes, the immune-mediated thrombosis comes too. So all those local inflammation, immune-mediated thrombosis uh, can happen, plus, you know, our tubular injury. 
And, uh, you know, this, well, our biopsy is limited. Usually when the COVID started, uh, they, we have we seen the COVID patient left and right. I'm really depressed to see all the COVID patients uh, in a COVID unit because we don't even have a room. So people are lining and uh, intubated and about 60, 70 patients. We are dialyzing left and right. So we don't have an opportunity to do biopsy, at least in my institution. Uh, we are swamped. So we don't know exactly, but uh, these data are coming from the uh, data from the, some of the centers from US and uh, Europe. Probably they, you know, they have opportunities to do uh, biopsy. Uh, so we find that some of the direct infe infection in the kidney cells too. So, but I think this is, uh, you know, uh, less common findings. They said, oh, COVID cells like uh, kidney cells as well, renal tropism also found. Okay, so, but you can see the direct infection, local inflammation, uh, you know, uh, pressure coming from the heart and lungs, things like that, that can have, and hypoxia. So kidneys are being attacked from the multiple ways and multiple channels, we cannot defend. So, uh, this is another nice uh, little picture uh, because <coughs> some people all say that, uh, okay, before you notice and rise in the creatinine, you have to see some of the changes in the, uh, you know, uh, urinalysis and, uh, you know, dipstick, things like that. Uh, we don't usually use a biomarkers here in the day-to-day -day clinical practice, but we use proteinuria. So some people say, oh, creatine might remain this stable, but you start to see the low molecular weight proteinuria, not albuminuria. Maybe some you can see the albuminuria, but low-grade uh, other proteinuria is more uh, prominent. Or mainly that's some of the glomerular injury. Uh, you see that half of the patient can have a proteinuria before you see actual rise in creatinine. So this is a good thing to do your analysis if, you know, while you're monitoring the uh, basal metabolic panel and creatinine, and you see the uh, hematuria too. So either one plus dipstick or uh, red cell more than 10 cells. So these are the kind of injury. Oh, patient might have an injury to the kidney. Let's see how it goes and monitor the uh, basal metabolic panel. He might develop a kidney injury. And after those manifestations of proteinuria and hematuria, you start to see the decline in the GFR, glomerular filtration rate, and start to increase in serum creatinine. So, and then goes up to the, uh, you know, you, I mentioned before three stages of the acute kidney injury, and then a patient may need a kidney replacement therapy or not. So, so coming, uh, acute kidney injury starting from the subclinical stages proteinuria, hematuria, and leading to going through the elevation in serum creatinine, and finally ending in the dialysis. So what is the proteinuria? So proteinuria, when you do the dipsticks, you see one plus or more dips, one plus, two plus. Oh, you can start to see that, oh, that's a glomerular injury. Some urinalysis mentioned about uh, 130 milligram per deciliter. It, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, it start to increase in the this number, so 30, so increase in the glomerular injury. Hematuria, the same thing, one plus or higher dipstick of urinalysis. You can start to see the early injury. Uh, but again, you see the proteinuria and hematuria uh, injury before they start to rise in the creatinine and drop in GFR. Another thing is chronic kidney disease, age, hypertension, diabetes can precipitate acute kidney injury. Uh, chronic kidney disease is the independent uh, uh, risk predictor for the acute kidney injury. If you have a stage three, four, five kidney, in, you know, chronic kidney disease, if you had a COVID, you are more likely to have acute kidney injury on top of CKD, whatever you are having before, because the kidneys are not uh, good kidneys. And uh, age, age, um, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, aging is not good. When you get older, GFR start to decline one mil per minute, uh, you know, uh, per year after 50 years. So if you have 70 years old gentleman, if you have uh, about, uh, some people say after 40 years, you start to lose GFR. 
So the voice number basic, you know, GFR is about 120. And then uh, if you have a 70%, so you already lost about 20%. So about a 90 or 100, but you, you don't see the change in the serial creating yet. GFR is declining by creating my holding. So those kind of patients and early people have a less ability to clear the COVID-19 infection. They have a less immunity, less disease response. So they have, a, they tend to have a severe disease, and also kidneys uh, has a functional reserve is very low, so they can easily uh, have acute kidney injury because they have a low GFR at baseline. Even though you don't see the rise in creatinine, of course, hypertension and diabetes, especially if you have a chronic and controlled hypertension, you kind of this is these are the chronic endothelial dysfunction disease hypertension and diabetes so when you have a, another endothelial dysfunction it accelerate the acute kidney injury all right uh, so these are the independent factors you know for the acute kidney injury chronic kidney disease age and hypertension okay Okay, so uh, like I said before, 50% uh, of patients, uh, they without acute kidney injury by KD eco criteria, they still have hematuria and 70% of proteinuria. So we have to look out for those. So presence of the urinalysis abnormalities in early phase, we can detect acute kidney injury before uh, increase in, we notice the increase in serum creatinine. And uh, this is the uh, table, you know, I will discuss about the factors that contribute to COVID-19 uh, associated acute kidney injury. So I show you the uh, picture. We have a tubular injury and you have a, a vascular injury. You have a glomerular injury. You have a interstitial injury. So these are the four main components. So when you tubules, comes to the tubules, you can have a regional inflammation from coming from the uh, inflammatory cells, uh, T cells, macrophage, and uh, neutrophils as well. And also the direct infection. And another thing is a renal compartment syndrome. The same thing like uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, intracranial hypertension, I would say. When you have a right heart failure, you know, increase in the venous pressure, it goes all the way back to the renal veins and renal, uh, you know, uh, perfusion is decreased and, you know, kidneys are congested. Mm -hmm. The kidneys are encapsulated organs, so you can have a, a kidney compartment syndrome. And also tissue hypoxia, hypoperfusion lead to the hypoxia, hypotension, and heart failure as well. And again, you know, your lungs are dead damage, your oxygenation organ is damaged. So you have a hypoxia all over the organ. So Kenny will have a hypoxia and they will suffer as well. And uh, they are sick, they might not have uh, or enough oral intake during the sickness. So they might have a hypovolemia. So we tend to initially, we can give a fluid. So giving a fluid uh, actually, you know, initial phase can, if, you see the improvement in creatinine, you are excluding the pre-renal cause of the acute kidney injury. But if you keep giving the fluid and urine outputs drops, like you see the 0.5 mil per kilo per you know, hour uh, for more than one, two days, and you keep giving fluid, the patient will be swollen. So in that case, hypovolemia turns into hypervolemia. So we have to uh, you know, think about that too. And especially when they have a uh, heart failure, we have to be considered about that. And tissue hypoxia can cause a heart failure itself. Volume overload, anemia, and also hypoxia. Uh, these are the factors for the heart failure too. Another thing is uh, if you use a nephrotoxic, you know, medications, uh, you can have a tubular injury. So you have to think about the, uh, you know, antibiotics you're using. Like I'm, I'm not using a gentamicin, a minoglycoside, vancomycin. Oh my God, vancomycin is the holy grail <laughs> in the United States. Whenever it comes in sepsis, we don't know cause could be pneumonia. 
pneumonia, UTI, everybody throws vancomycin and zosin, kind of like a holy grail. Okay, so in that case, vancomycin can cause uh, acute interstitial nephritis, and vancomycin can cause acute tubular injury by itself as well. And also the Rendep server, we use a lot, we used to use a lot in the uh, COVID patients. But Rendep server, in the study, when we use the Rendep server, they excluded patients with uh, uh, kidney problem. They exclude the patient if the GFR is less than 30 mil per minute. So we don't know the safety of the Rendep server. So we better not to use it because the, uh, you know, Rendep server can may not directly, you know, you know, doing the you know, kidney injury by itself, but it is, you know, uh, filtered by the kidneys, and so we better we better not to use it. And another thing is rhabdomyolysis, and um, rhabdomyolysis. Okay, so you know, there's a strong, pain, you know, kind of like a flu-like, you know, you have a muscle aches and things like that. You have a muscle damage. So your, you know, CPK, phosphokinase, will, creating phosphokinase will go up and rhabdomyolysis can cause a cast too. So from that, you can have a jugular injury too. Uh, so, so these are the, you know, factors which can cause acute tubular injury. So you can see only the kidney, one part of the tubules and many, many, you know, uh, renal insults can affect the tubules. Uh, so this is the uh, tubular injury. And uh, another one is, okay, this is the picture. <clears throat> and uh, you can see the uh, cytokine storm coming to the kidneys. So it can cause a local inflammation. And then uh, you can see again, uh, damps like, you know, damage associated molecular pathogens. It can cause endothelial dysfunction, thrombosis. And then lungs can directly come from the hypoxia, uh, things like that. So uh, kidneys can be damaged in various ways. And then uh, elderly people increase, uh, you know, decrease their immune response. Uh, so that can uh, do more damage on that. And then again, rhabdomyolysis can cause proximal uh, tubule obstruction and injury too. And there is a systemic inflammation. Uh, so you can see the pericarditis in COVID patients too. So myocarditis, pericarditis. So that's why you can have a heart failure. So you can have a forward failure, backward failure. So forward failure, you have an arterial end of failing. So you won't have enough oxygen to the kidneys. Like I mentioned before, kidney consume about 25% of cardiac output. So Again, then it goes up, you know, go back to venous congestion and can do renal compartment syndrome too. So everything is related. So that's why I said that uh, COVID uh, is a thromboinflammatory condition. Very terrible. It's very disastrous uh, disease. So, and then uh, you can see the uh, kidneys have a talk. Kidneys talking to the lungs by doing the hypoxia. And by going the inflammation, sharing the inflammation from the cytokine storm. So kidneys and lungs are talking to each other. Hey, you are hit. I'm going to hit too. So you may hear about the pulmonary renal syndrome. I like it a lot, like ankle vasculitis, things like that. And then, uh, you know, in the COVID uh, affected tissues, you can have a vasculitis like damage too from the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory response. So so that's why lungs and kidneys are talking, hey, I'm not in a good condition, please help me. Oh, I cannot help you, I'm in a bad shape too. So something like that. Another thing is uh, uh, cardiorenal syndrome. We all know that, you know, a uh, patient heart is failing and then they cannot do the uh, effective pumping. The same thing, you know, the heart can be affected by myocarditis, uh, myocardial dysfunction, the ejection fraction will reduce. At the same time, kidneys are going down too. And then uh, they have a, not only the left heart failure, they can affect the right heart failure too. And they can cause venous conjunction, adrenal edema, renal compartment syndrome can happen. So kidneys are talking to the lungs, kidneys are talking to the heart. They all are sharing the same burden and they're not in a good shape. So another thing is vascular injury. 
<coughs> like I mentioned before, uh, blood vessels are uh, two types, glomerular capillaries, and they can have a uh, endothelial uh, inflammation, endothelitis, and also that can lead to coagulation cascading, endothelial, you know, uh, coagulation, microthrombi, and also another thing is thrombotic microangiopathy can happen. And glomerular injury. So glomerular nephritis is, I think, underreported because of the difficulty in renal biopsy. And, but less severe patient uh, in the United States, some center, they're not in the ICU patient, but they're COVID positive, they do that. And they find a collapsing glomerulopathy. So that's a, a similar to the interferon associated porosite injury. That's why interferon treatment, I think they haven't tested much. So, and also the interstitial injury. It can be from the uh, venous congestion, edema. You can get a, you know, interstitial edema. And also you can have interstitial nephritis just by, you know, infiltration of immune cells, T cell, macrophage, neutrophils, things like that. And you can get a interstitial nephritis from medication you're using too. So like uh, uh, Zosin, which is the pepazolin, and also the uh, vancomycin, interstitial nephritis. So we have to uh, look at the uh, medication every day to do that. Okay. And then, uh, do you have any questions so far? Hello? Oh, okay. I will continue that. And acute tubular injury is the most common uh, finding autopsy results. So, and then a collapsing and thrombotic microangiopathy are common too. So, so like I said before, this is kind of like, a, have you guys heard about the high band HIV associated nephropathy? So this is sim, you know, similar findings with the COVID-19 associated nephropathy. Uh, usually occur in the non-severe cases. It's, it is in fact, you know, happen in the HIV, you know, EB virus, CMV too. So it is associated with the APOL1 uh, genotypes as well and observed mostly in Afro-American people. So basically porosite injury. So endothelial injury and coagulation as cascade. So we will talk about, uh, you know, uh, briefly now, so when you, you see the, why the lungs are more effective, we have the flu. Okay, we, people, a lot of people die from the flu pneumonia too, right? But this COVID pneumonia is severe too. Why? Because this is a lot of thrombosis in the lungs compared with the flu pneumonia. That's why you see the, oh, bilateral infiltrate, bilateral pneumonia. Sometimes even though bilateral infiltrates are not severe, but patient oxygenation is very low because of the thrombosis. So like I said, again, I'll remind you, thromboinflammatory disease, COVID is. And then, you know, uh, endothelial injury, complement activation, prelate activation, circulating from thrombotic antibodies are major drivers. We don't know the true incidence in the kidney uh, involvement because we don't have a chance to do kidney biopsy on every patient. So especially, I mentioned you before, especially it is most severe hypertension and diabetes are the uh, uh, you know, independent risk factors for AKI and COVID patients. Why? They have a chronic endothelial dysfunction, especially you let the diabetes and hypertension and control. Why is that? Because uh, uh, you have a decreased nitric oxide synthase and then nitric oxide was low. Nitric oxide is very good for the uh, vasodilator and uh, anti-inflammatory. So immunosuppressants, usually immune response and inflammatory, they, you know, uh, go hand in hand. Immunosuppressants is a term we use for the innate and adaptive immunologic inter, you know, alteration with aging. When we get older, nothing is good. So you affect both innate and adaptive immune uh, system. So it is characterized by inflammation, important in organ dysfunction, because they have a less viral clearance, less effective T cells, less antibody production from B cell. Basically, your immune system is down. Your innate immune system is down. Your humoral immune system is down. Your adaptive immune system is down. So 
when we get older, those immune systems are going down, decreased viral clearance. So COVID is more severe in elderly people. And uh, that's why elderly people, people with the in chronic inflammatory response, like a high, chronic endothelial dysfunction, hypertension, diabetes, and people with CKD, they have all uh, poor prognosis. And also, the uh, it can cause, you know, uh, this is a picture, you know, COVID-19 virus affect, you know, binds an ACE2 as receptor. It can cause lymphopenia. It can cause cytokine storm. It can cause direct, you know, viral infection tubular damage, borocyte damage. So these are the, uh, you know, pictures. The end goal is the same. You can have a tubular injury, interstitial inflammation, borocyte injury, glomerular injury, endothelial injury, different type of injury and different type of tissues. And a hypoxia, hypotension, they affect each other. So cardiac disease, lung disease, uh, organ stock, things like that. And again, uh, these patients, uh, you can have a sepsis too. So you have uh, infection from urine infection. You can have a super added uh, bacteria pneumonia in addition to viral pneumonia. So it, SARS virus enter the cells through the ACE2. So it is an enzyme within the rest system. So metaboliz metabolizing the angiotensin 2 to uh, angiotensin 1 to 7. Angiotensin uh, 2 can... Uh, activate endothelium and platelets that can cause the pro-inflammatory cytokine. It can incite the severe inflammation. Angiotensin 1 to 7 is good one. It can cause vasodilatation and anti-inflammatory effect. So whenever you have an infection, it use ACE2 receptor. So we have a less ACE2 re receptor. So we have less angiotensin 1 to 7. We have more angiotensin 2. So that angiotensin uh, two is a bad stuff. So that lead to all the inflammatory cascade. So that ACE2 is down-regulated. So we don't want angiotensin two. So right now here, we are testing the recombinant human serum ACE2 you know, uh, receptor. So if you give it like that, that uh, you know, recombinant ACE2 receptor can go and bind the SARS virus. So at least, you know, as much as we can give, they can bind the SARS virus and they can, SARS virus can affect less damage on the native uh, ACE2 receptor. So we can have a uh, more conversion to angiotensin from angiotensin 2 so that we have less angiotensin 2 and less damage. So here, this one I'm talking about second line, angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7 by angiotensin uh, is receptor two. So these receptor needs to be abandoned, needs to be available in the body. That's why we're trying to give uh, from outside, giving the recombinant ACE2 receptors. So it can bind the, you know, SARS-2, COVID-2, and it can stop the infection. So we need to have more angiotensin. It can cause vascular protection, antifibrosis, vasodilatation, anti-inflammation, more nitric oxide. So if we have a less availability of ACE2, we have more angiotensin 2 because angiotensin 2 cannot be uh, converted to angiotensin. So we have more vasoconstriction, more damage, more fibrosis, more, it's a pro-inflammatory hormone and more oxidative stress. Okay, so this is the I talked before that uh, crowd, you know, organ crosstalk, kidney talks to the lung, talks to the, uh, uh, heart as well. Uh, I mentioned before that acute hypoxia leads to the hypoxia itself, uh, renal vascular resistance, renal vascular constriction, and also renal hypoperfusion and injury itself. It's coming from the uh, front, you know, uh, blood coming from the renal artery, hypoxia, red blood cell carry oxygen. So you have a less oxygen, you know, situation because of the lungs damage. Uh, oh, we have a low oxygen, we have to constrict the blood vessels. So renal artery constrict, you, you have a more resistant, less delivery to the, uh, less delivery of oxygen to the kidneys. So you have a more tubular injury. And mechanical ventilation, and of course, we use a FiO2 100 and then a titrate down 80, 90, things like that. But again, even though you are intubated, oxygen saturation is, sometimes you, you will see the desaturation. 
so that if you have a, some patients on mechanical ventilation, that's mean that your oxygen saturation is not stable. So these are no surprise to see more acute kidney injury patients with COVID who are mechanically ventilated. So <clears throat> another interesting thing is following the acute kidney injury, you see the inflammatory cytokines like uh, uh, you know, interleukin-6, uh, which is a very uh, famous uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. It could be from the decreased venous clearance or it could be, you know, both, you know, increased production and decreased clearance, but it can contribute to respiratory failure through the kidneys uh, because of the, you know, uh, decreased clearance. It can go to interleukin-6, go to the lungs and more uh, damage by doing the local inflammatory response. That's, you know, by having acute kidney injury can cause lung damage. And a cardio renal syndrome, again, uh, cardiac dysfunction, you know, decreased uh, kidney perfusion because of the decreased cardiac output. And also that's a forward failure. From the backward failure, again, you have a right heart failure and renal vein conjunction. So, and also the, when you have a mechanically ventilated patient, we try to increase the PEEP uh, by you know, opening the airways. But when you, when you use that and they have a pulmonary edema, and then when you, you have to use something tighter volume, a high tighter volume. And in that case, you know, if you have a high you know, positive uh, NS expiration pressure, that can cause an uh, increase the intrathoracic pressure because you're mechanically ventilating the patient, high pressure in both lungs, right heart failure, right ventricle, right atrial pressure. That can go to the backward failure. And also you have a uh, you know, high pressure system in both lungs. It can suppress the uh, diaphragm. So it can uh, decrease the output too. So all things are perpetuate each other. So right heart dysfunction, increased venous pressure, that can lead to interstitial edema and also the tubular hydrostatic pressure within the encapsulated organs. So that's why kidney function decline too. Your kidneys are congested. It can decrease the uh, blood supply too. Another thing is a nephrotoxin. We always talk, we already talk about vancomycin and cholestin. So we will talk about Randevsiva, like I said, the study doesn't include uh, GFR less than 30 mil per minute. So we don't have a safety data for those patients. You know, for people with normal kidney function, I would say, okay, but is it really effective? That's my question. So we don't see any benefit in patient outcomes. And, uh, so, and then rhabdomyolysis, I already talked about that. Uh, but we have to think about that. This is a non-pharmacological mechanism, but also uh, myoglobin, it can be toxic to the kidney tubules. So another thing is ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, a lot of patients on ECMO, they require the uh, kidney replacement therapy too. But uh, ECMO is good for oxygenation, but again, ECMO by itself can contribute to acute kidney injury. It can cause uh, infection, secondary infection, and ECMO's membrane oxygenation can cause hemolysis and major bleeding and more inflammation. So if you really need a uh, ECMO, just do it, but it's not without the risks. But uh, we have a limited availability of the ECMO even in the United States. Okay, so I'll be a little bit more focused on the uh, more clinical side. So a lot of, <clears throat> we all know that, uh, you know, 10 to 15% of the uh, hospitalized COVID patients require the acute, uh, you know, kidney injury and require the kidney replacement therapy, which is kind of basically dialysis. Uh, so most of the patients that do not recover, uh, why? Because kidney injury is so intense. You can have a multiple insults, microthrombi, tubular injury, glomerular injury, interstitial nephritis, interstitial edema, things like that. So they don't recover. In my patients, uh, uh, I, I have a lot of patients during the COVID second wave with the ventilator. Only two patients survived and they got out of the uh, dialysis. Uh, 
most of the patient die more than 90 percent die if they require dialysis and mechanical ventilation uh, some of them require require the some of them have a tracheostomy ventilator they wean off the they are wean off ventilator but still on dialysis only two patients uh, they are off ventilator they are off uh, dialysis so I feel, you know, uh, I feel great satisfaction when I see one of them. So th one of them is still following me in my clinic. Uh, and independent risk factors for the acute kidney injury. We know that mechanical ventilation because hypoxia is not, you know, it's variable and predictable. And whenever you have an increased visual pressure requirement, you are high likelihood of acute kidney injury. Some people are, uh, you know, drip on liver fat, epinephrine, not epinephrine, drip, vasopressin, drip. The higher two, three, four, five, you know, vasopressin, high likelihood of acute kidney injury because of the hypotension. And we already talked about risk factor for death, old age, oliguria, poor resources. Some local hospital doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, enough, uh, you know, dialysis staff, dialysis machine, or ventilator, things like that. We have to prepare the, uh, you know, ICU bed, ventilator, and dialysis machine, depending on the local population. So Texas was swamped, our area was swamped. So I think uh, the federal government sent us the nurses and uh, machines and ventilators. So I remember, still remember last year. So kind of like uh, we see a lot of people from out of state, nurses, doctors, and all the machine equipment. So we prepare it, they distribute the uh, resources. So unfortunately, I don't see in my mother country. Uh, so a lot of people die, unfortunately, I guess, if they are hypoxic, we cannot do anything. We cannot even intubate for some of the patients, people I know. So it's very unfortunate and very tragic to see or hear those news. All right, anyway. Uh, so ICU patient, if they require the, you know, ventilation and uh, acute kidney injury and dialysis, they feel 28 days mortality is very high. Half of the patient die if they, you know, but if you need a dialysis, more than higher percentage, you know, died. So I already mentioned that I only know two patients among my all patients. So uh, pretty high. And uh, like I said, optimization of volume status is uh, of paramount importance. You know, initial phase of the COVID, when they admitted they have a poor oral intake, they are sick, they might have a pre-renal acute kidney injury. So we give a fluid, uh, we can give a, uh, um, you know, a, you know, normal saline or ringer lactate. They are more or less the same. If they have a metabolic acidosis, we use a ringer lactate. If really have a pro profound metabolic acidosis, we use a, a bike up, you know, a solution. But again, if the patient has an oliguria, the unit output is less than 400, 500 a day and 0.5 mil per kilo per hour for more than six hours, please be careful. They can have a hypovolemia. They can worsen the respiratory status (ARDS) if the patient has it. So we need to look at the intake and output balance. Should be looked at thoroughly. Patient might have a insensible loss, you know, 500, but you know, intake output should be balanced. And then uh, if they are becoming, if patient is septic, basal press, and things like that, we have to give a fluid, of course. And then if the patient that, you know. Oliguria sets in, we have to be, you know, uh, decrease the rate of the fluid we're giving, uh, but uh, they will definitely have a positive balance, but we will try to uh, reduce the positive balance as much as uh, we can. Positive balance is okay, a little bit of positive balance is okay, as long as they don't have a respiratory issues. If you patients have a respiratory issues, I will keep at least even balance or even a little slightly net negative balance. So, so we can do the careful diuresis. If the patient has oliguria, we can give a Lasix, uh, 20, 40, 80, depend on the GFR. You can, you know, increase gradually. I don't want to, uh, you know, injury uh, perpetuate by giving the diuretics as well. So when the other, uh, you know, acute kidney injury uh, etiology should be considered as well. And then we can check the uh, arterial blood gas. You know, if the pH is less than 7.2, you can start giving the backup drip. I usually less than 7.3, I start to give it. 
uh, for because of the you know, protective mechanisms. And uh, again, uh, if let's say a patient has metabolic acidosis, we give a fluid to, you know, for a few days, patients now become hypervolemic. Uh, we cannot give a bicarb drip. So we use uh, diuretics a little bit. And also we can consider bicarb pushes. We, if you give a one M of bicarb push, it includes about bicarb 50 milli equivalent. So we can give it, we can give a bicarb pushes one M, you know, every six hour, every eight hours, depending on the needs. So, and then uh, you can use uh, dexamethasone, which is kind of, you know, immune modulator. It is uh, effective in the COVID infection as well. It is good for COVID associated AIDS as well. And it is proven beneficial. Uh, so we will use that. So dexamethasone is, you can use equivalent dose. Usually we use dexamethasone 6 milligram daily. You can use prednisone, methylprednisone, hydrocortisone, as long as you use uh, equivalent doses, that should be okay. But dexamethasone is the one who's tested in the trials. Again, call, if patients have uh, acute interstitial nephritis, it will uh, take care of it too. Another thing is we need to review the medications every day. I don't want to use uh, you know, unnecessary medications, you know, unless they're they're not proven beneficial, no. If the patient's taking, of course, seizure medication, we will continue that. If the patient has a history of GI bleed, continue the Protonix. You give the you know, anticoagulation uh, to prevent the uh, thromboembolism. Uh, but uh, when you use antibiotics, you have to adjust the uh, medications, doses, depend on the GFR. Like I said, creatine is one day one, another day is three, 4.55 next day. So. Uh, the, the significant decline in renal function is noted within a few days, which is unusual for other acute kidney injury, unless you have a severe glomerulonephritis or bilateral renal artery obstruction or bilateral uterus, you know, obstruction. So if your GFR go down uh, a lot and then you have to decrease the dose, but when the GFR uh, is recovers, kidney function is getting better, you will increase the uh, titrate up the uh, doses too. So GFI is very dynamic. In those periods, you have to be carefully adjusting the dose of the medication. And avoid not to use, uh, you know, uh, nephrotoxins like NSAIDs. Uh, for ACEI, you know, I kind of like a neutral, it cannot cause harm, but I, again, it's not beneficial a lot either. So especially patients with acute kidney injury, I don't use ACE of up uh, because, uh, you know, it can, uh, it cannot, you know, uh, it can dilate the efferent uh, renal arterioles, so angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, so they cannot, you know, uh, convert it, uh, so they cannot constrict. So you need to constrict the efferent arterioles to increase the GFR. If your efferent arterioles is dilated by giving the up, so GFR will decrease. So I, I tend not to use it. Another thing is uh, contrast studies, you know, oh, patients have uh, pneumonia and then, oh, I want to rule out the PE. Come on, give me a break. They are on uh, thromboprophylactic doses. You know, sometimes, unless necessary, if you're giving the therapeutic doses, uh, finding the additional diagnosis might not harm, it might not change. The management of plan, I wouldn't allow to do the non-essential steps. So please don't do it. You can do it when the patient is stable, but Right now, don't do it. If you give an IV contrast for CD scan, you can have a, a more damage to the kidneys and kidney function cannot recover. Okay, so all, this is very essential. You have to do with contrast for the PE. Okay, then patient is not very, very volume overloaded. You can give a gender hydration using the bicarb drip or you know, NS, you can do that. So like I said, I have white, you know, ACE or up if they have a associated acute uh, kidney injury because it can dilate the efferent arterioles and reduce GFR. For the high blood pressure control, you can use, uh, patient can take oral, you can use uh, amlodipine, afedipine, metoprolol, hydralazine, you know, clonidine patch, things like that, minoxidil, you can use it. Uh, diuretics, use your judgment. If patient hypervolemic, you use it judiciously. Uh, mitral drain, if patients need a presser, one or two presser, I start to use mitral drain because it's kind of like a, 
uh, constrict the vasoconstrictor, increase the blood vessels a little bit. But if the patient has a, you know, uh, kind of ischemic changes, I tend not to use it. So another thing I want to stress about it, only use essential medications, essential medication. Uh, I tend to hold or discontinue non-essential medication uh, or folic acid, vitamin B12. No, don't give me those kind of, you know, PS medication. So no, don't use it. You can use it later on, uh, but I don't want anything which can, you know, filter by the kidneys and uh, overwhelming the kidneys. So you have to judiciously use your medications as well. And another thing is do not delay the... <clears throat> kidney replacement therapy or renal replacement therapy. When you see patients start to become uh, volume overloaded, potassium start to go up, BUN creating start to go up. And then if I see the oliduria, I start to discuss with the patient if they are uh, communicable. Otherwise I talk to the family members, hey, your patients, uh, you know, your family members, your wife, husband or son, kidney function is going down. Uh, we will do our best, you know, not to uh, progress to the dialysis stage. But uh, again, I cannot guarantee 100%. A lot of people need uh, dialysis. So you might need dialysis so that they won't get any surprises. Let's say you hold that information and one day you came in, hey, your patients need, your family members need dialysis. They're going to be upset. So you have to start to discuss with the patient or family members about renal replacement therapy. And then a rate and time to progression, like I said before, very fast. So creating one and then next day, two, three, boom, boom, boom. So uh, we have to be very careful. I will avoid random silver in my AKI patients. Another thing is uh, logistics. Logistics is the issue in most of the hospitals because we don't have enough dialysis nurses or machines initially when we are swamped with multiple patients. So uh, usually COVID patient, you have to wear the you know, PPE and stuff, things like that. So you can dialyze only one to one. Later on, we have to complain to administration. This is logistically possible because dialysis nurses are not going home. They're dialyzing at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and next day they came in at 8 a.m., so they're drowsy and they're not do the you know, judgment uh, sensibly. So uh, we dialyzed at three, four, two, three patients at the same time in the same room. So we can save the PPE, we can save the limited exposure to dialysis patient. So what I'm trying to say is if the patients are hemodynamically stable, they are not on press, uh, uh, we can use a traditional hemodialysis machine and we can dialyze them. Usually I start <coughs> slow, uh, dialyze three days straight. Uh, the reason is, uh, you know, you have a condition called disequilibrium syndrome because you have a hyperkalemia, electrolyte, PUN. They can mess up. They can, I don't want that toxin level reduce uh, you know, significantly within one day. So I do only two hours, low blood flow, 200 mil per, you know, a minute and dialysis flow about 300, 400, gradually, you know, adjusting the body to dialysis and increasing the dialysis time to two hours, two and a half hour, next day, three hour, things like that. So I'm doing all those things to avoid disequilibrium syndrome. Again, uh, pay attention to the fluid balance. I tend to keep at least even if I cannot get it, especially the intubated. I tend to do the at least negative uh, 500 cc one liter every day. And then if the hemodynamic is tolerable, I'm trying to uh, remove as much as we can later on. Let's say, for example, initial five, six days, patients above you know, a 10 liter overloaded, we have to diaries. If the patient's not urinating, we're talking about dialysis. And then uh, we start dialysis in three days, we might, you know, remove about two, three liter, but later on you do daily dialysis to catch up the uh, fluid overload. You have to monitor the check X-ray daily or every other day, depend on your needs. So you have to check the, you know, oxygen requirement on the ventilator, non-invasive ventilation. And then uh, with the fluid removal, you have to see the uh, pulmonary edema is getting better or not. If it is better, that's good. Uh, okay, volume overload is getting better, pulmonary edema is getting better. But again, if you remove about uh, net negative balance 
and then uh, the check signature should get clear, but still bilateral infiltrate, maybe your underlying bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia may show up after the uh, volume overload issue is taken care of. So if you see bilateral infiltrate in the check signature, it could be two issues. It could be only the infiltrate alone. It could be infiltrate, uh, pulmonary edema alone. In that case, you know, uh, pulmonary uh, bilateral infiltrate should disappear or go away after uh, you did a good job on dialysis. But if they persist, you might have, uh, your patients might have uh, two different issues, uh, pneumonia plus pulmonary edema. So we have to think about that. And then uh, we will continue treatment with antibiotics. Uh, you do the blood culture, sputum culture, urine culture. Depending on the needs, you can escalate the antibiotics or you can discalate, you know, discalate the uh, antibiotics. Like I said, you use uh, dexamethasone for every patient. And then uh, you can use a uh, docilizumab like an interleukin-6 inhibitor. It can uh, uh, reduce the, you know, inflammatory cytokine. But, you know, we talk about inflammatory cytokine response, you know, cytokine storm, you know, in a COVID patient. But, you know, when you compare with the ARDS with the non-COVID, you know, issues, and the, the amount of our cytokines is lower in COVID patients. So even though we talk a lot about cytokine storm, the, the contributing factor may be a lot less compared with the non-COVID associated, uh, you know, uh, cytokine storm. So, but again, it's, you know, tocilizumab is good and proven benefit, so we use it. And then uh, we should talk to the family and update daily conditions. Oh, usually I talk about the uh, kidney function. Oh, kidneys are not opening up. Kidneys are still, you know, sleeping or they're damaged. They kind of stand. They cannot function uh, well right now. So machine takes over just cleaning the, uh, you know, toxins and uh, removing the fluid. Um, but we need to look at the native kidneys function, things like that. If the patient starts to pee a little better, uh, you know, clearance is better more than a clearance from the machine. So, okay, kidney function is regaining, but again, this is not 100% uh, uh, you know, guarantee for the recovery yet. So we have to talk to the family members daily and update them. And then if they have other questions about uh, ventilator setting or oxygen requirement, uh, I can uh, give them a brief uh, a synopsis. Okay, oxygen requirement is going down, FiO2 is going down to 80 from 100. But uh, please, you know, ask the primary intensivist for the detailed questions so that you won't, uh, you know, step on other people's toes. Uh, and then if the patients, some patients are not, you know, uh, uh, not doing well, I think COVID is the most depressing, you know, period in my entire career so far, I guess. You know, patients are dying left and right, no matter how you do. So... You have to talk about the palliative care too. It is very sad. Family member doesn't have a chance to say goodbye or they can see the patient. They just see it from the, uh, we use the iPad and then uh, they use a different, you know, platforms to see, you know, to show the patient. So some people are saying goodbye through the iPad. So it is very tragic uh, to see those scenes and and forgettable. You know, uh, so you have to talk about the uh, palliative care. Uh, elderly people, patients, they are, you know, family members are easy to talk, but young people, you know, it's very difficult. They they are not ready to lose their loved ones. So it is very difficult and hard. You know, it's a depressing too. So, but you have to talk about that. Here, as we have a, uh, you know, you know, you go status, you have to discuss that. Usually the primary doctors, internal medicine doctor do that. You are, you know, uh, do not resuscitate or do not intubate. Uh, if they said DNR, do not uh, intubate, do not resuscitate DNR, DNI. So usually when they have a cardiopulmonary arrest, we won't do, you know, ACLS protocol. We don't do chest compression. We don't do anything, let them go. But uh, if they say, oh no, full cold, meaning that if they have a, uh, cardiopulmonary arrest, you do everything, chest compression, ACLS protocol, everything. So you have to, the, as an internist, you should discuss about the uh, co status as well so that you won't be surprised. You won't be calling the family members when the time comes. And uh, another thing is even though, you know, they are very prone to have a, 
you know, cardiopulmonary arrest because of the hypoxia, uh, because, you know, the causes of the uh, cardiopulmonary arrest, you know, everything. So they tend to depend on the duration of the ACLS, they tend to have anoxia encephalopathy. Uh, we have a return of circulation. We resuscitate the patient. Patients alive on intubator dialysis, but they never wake up. They never had a, a good mentation, or they never able to interact with you. I have uh, one patient now in the ICU. Uh, his BUN was 140, 150. Creating was 8, 9, 10. You know, I told him, "Hey, you need dialysis." While he's awake, he was breathing on a uh, you know, high flow nasal cannula and uh, he's on a BiPAP off and on. I told them, hey, come on, man, you need a, you know, dialysis, let's start earlier so that you can avoid that. He has a pulmonary edema. He said, no, I don't want dialysis. I don't want dialysis. So what happened is he doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, advanced, you know, uh, you know, power of attorney or just Foucault. He didn't say that. And then primary doctor didn't do that yet. And then on weekends, I'm off and another nephrologist who were covering for me <laughs> when I came back to the service on Monday, I see that oh, that patient is intubated and dialysis were already started. Hey, come on, I told us, what's going on? This guy said no, no to dialysis. What's going on? We're not doing right. And what happened is he had a cold blue and he, uh, but fortunately uh, he was resuscitated and the doctors called the family members and, and uh, his wife and said, oh, no, Dallas is everything, do everything we can. So that's why my partner need to study the dialysis. So these things can happen. Uh, but uh, he doesn't have a meaningful, you know, meaningful uh, neurological recovery. He doesn't know. He has still have a brainstem reflexes, but uh, he doesn't know what we're talking about. Uh, it might blink occasionally, not meaningfully. You know, those kind of people, you will see that a lot. Later on, you keep dialyzing, and then uh, there's, uh, <laughs> you know, questions about medical leg issues too. The sister and wife are saying that, oh, continue that. Hospitals, doctors are talking about withdrawing the care. Oh, we're going to sue you and blah, blah, blah. Things like that can happen. So we have to continue dial dialysis and continue mechanical ventilation, even though patient develop the announcer brain injury so those kind of things can happen too so we have to uh, talk about the will of the family and patients as well so these are the important aspects you know of the practice too so again uh, <coughs> another part is that we have to think about the hemodialysis nurses and their health too so like i said we used to dialyze initially one to one logistically not possible so we let the dialysis patient dialyze about two three hours uh of two three patients at the same time uh before that uh, this you know if the patients are you know, where there's a, another dialysis form called as a crt or ckrt continuous kidney replacement therapy which is kind of like a slow dialysis, but you do dialysis about uh, 10, 12 hours, sometimes 24 seven. You do that because especially uh, CRT or CKRT is the best modality of dialysis, uh, especially people with unstable, hemodynamically unstable patients and patients with uh, acute brain injury. So it's easy on the central perfusion pressure, that's why. But COVID patients, uh, some nephrologists say, oh, CRT is the best, you know, uh, you know, even your patient is hemodynamically stable or not, you know, and then uh, because logistically possible too, you can start CRT for one patient and you can start another CRT on the patients in the adjacent room, things like that. So dialysis nurses can do CRT for two, three patients at the same time, things like that. But again, not a lot of hospitals have a CRD expertise, CRD nurses. Some of the ICU nurses are CRD trained, but some of them are not. So not consistent training uh, was provided to across the nurses. So it's a little, another barrier. But I intend to choose uh, CKRT uh, for hemodynamically unstable patients. Some people with uh, intracranial bleed, I do that. But most of the patients who are tolerable, we do the regular traditional dialysis. Uh, 
another form uh, during the midway is called uh, we call it we used to call I was trained in nephrology five six seven years ago so we call it sustained low efficiency dialysis slat now they're calling the prolonged intermittent kidney replacement therapy, meaning that uh, it's kind of like a traditional machine, traditional kidney replacement therapy, traditional dialysis, but uh, we do intermittent, not, uh, <coughs> not continuous, but it's like a little bit of prolonged. We usually do uh, three to four hours in the outpatient dialysis in the United States, uh, but this one is we call SLED or PIKRT. We usually do six to eight hours because of low flows in uh, hospitals where they don't have a CRT. So you can, uh, you can use that too. So, you know, but we have to use whatever we need, but I don't think in Myanmar we can, I don't hear anybody even in ICU, I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, they're dialyzing the COVID patients. I'm not sure they are able to dialyze or not. Uh, because of the, you know, a scarcity of the resources and nurses. So, but here we we have at least traditional, you know, machine and and then we have to tweak around, you know, kind of a little prolonged intermittent uh, dialysis uh, for six to eight hours for hemodynamically unstable patient. If they are hemodynamically stable, we do the traditional three to four hours. So now COVID is getting better and then we can manage it. Still admitted uh, some of the patients and vaccinated patients here in the United States. This is a lot of issue too. You have a lot of anti-vaccination people too. They came in. Now more the incentive and you can get even $100 if you get vaccinated. <laughs> so now more and more people are vaccinated and then we have a less severity of the COVID cases uh, in the hospital. So we are relieved now. So, but again, uh, overall, you know, kidneys can be damaged in a severe different ways, acute kidney injury, uh, glomerular injury, microthrombi, uh, injury interstitial edema, many ways kidney can be attacked. Different parts of the kidney tissues are attacked in different ways. Hypoxia is a major factor. So we correct the hypoxia. We carefully look at the medications, use of fluid judiciously, start uh, hemodialysis early, and uh, use uh, you know evidence-based medicine. Uh, and then uh, some of the new medications are in the pipeline. Uh, you know that's recommended. You know, uh, serum uh, ACE2 receptor kind of medication treatment. These are in the pipeline. You know from maybe may not be possible because of the protocyte injury. We can continue to use dexamethasone, you know, interleukin, uh, uh, tocilizumab, IL-6 inhibitor, things like that. And then we have uh, vaccin vaccinations, rolling out rate is increasing. So things are getting better. I think we will see the COVID around most of the time. Yeah, but we will do whatever we can. Uh, we are now having a booster dose. So we have to be careful still. The practice pattern was changing. Before that, <laughs> even the, some of the, you know, we, we are shy to use the marks, you know, in the hospital setting. Now we have to use it as a mandatory, especially regular marks, surgical marks. But when you go through the COVID unit, you still have a, you know, PPE and uh, N95 marks. Now we got a hospital have uh, enough supply, so we are okay. But uh, again, uh, we have to, you know, give it to the uh, developing countries and, uh, you know, we have to give, share with the uh, abundance of the supplies too, because COVID anyways, COVID everywhere. So they can mutate and we have to pray for the heart. Vaccination is good and we don't need too much, you know, I know maybe, you know, you can have a vaccination like flu vaccine every year, something like that, who knows, you know? So, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for listening and I will take any questions.